Romans 10, 9, it says, if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I'll be saved. Well, good evening. Welcome to One Man's Faith. My name is Neil Owen. Glad to have you with me again tonight. And we're going to look at the Word of God and just talk about some things. And so let's open, as we normally do, with looking at a psalm. And so I'm going to pick Psalm 46 tonight. I really, I used this earlier this week, and I really like this psalm. This is a neat psalm. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The Lord of Jacob is our stronghold. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots of fire. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Beautiful psalm. Beautiful psalm. But what's he saying? What's he saying? God, he, he starts by saying, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. He is there. He's just waiting for you to call out. God, help me. And so he says, because God is our refuge and strength, therefore we won't fear. Though the earth should change, though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. That's nothing, he's saying, because God is our refuge and our strength. We don't have to worry about those things. He's our present help. Therefore, we won't fear. No matter what happens, are we there? <laughs> You know, there's a lot of turmoil. I mean, just you just look at the news and you see all these, all the earthquakes that have happened, all the flooding now that's occurring in the, in the east. Uh, even the Philippines has recently been flooded. New Zealand has flooded and had tornadoes. You know, if we were chicken littles, it would be easy to say, ah, the earth is falling in. But no, God is our refuge and help, our very present, or refuge, God is our refuge and strength, our very help in trouble, no matter what happens on the earth. We put our trust in Him. He, he is in charge. God is in charge. And I like what He says. He says, come and behold the works of the Lord who has wrought desolation in the earth, he makes wars to cease. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots of fire. Then he says, cease striving or let go. The word, believe it or not there, is rafa, which is one of the Hebrew words that means healing. And so he says, let go, be healed, cease striving, don't worry about it. <clears throat> and this is God speaking. God is saying, let go. I'm in charge. I know that I am God. I will be exalted in the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Wow, isn't that neat? God is our stronghold. So don't see striving. Let go. Be healed. Don't worry. These are things that we are, as Christians are not supposed to do because God is our refuge and our strength, the very present help 
in times of trouble. But to have that within you means you've got to trust God and have faith in what he's going to do. You can start now to say, Father, forgive me. Lord, I am, I am worried to death. But I hand it over to you. You are my refuge and my strength. I want to be like David. And no matter what happens around me, you are here. You are in control. You are my refuge and my strength. And you can say that right now. And let's do that. And let's just start this hour off. Let his peace and his comfort envelop you overpower you and let you feel that his presence he is your refuge and your strength father we just thank you for this evening lord we thank you that you are the king of kings and the lord of lords lord i know that things happen all around us and they're not and it's not you But you are the one, Father, that we can call on. Lord, I thank you that you have placed us in control of this earth. You have said, come, be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth. And Father, help us to understand that and to walk in that. And thank you, Father, that you are with us. You are our refuge and our strength. And so, Father, we fall back on that to rely upon that. Lord, just be with us tonight. Lord, bring peace and comfort to these homes that are watching. May they sense and know that you are there with them. And I thank you, Lord, for your presence. Touch lives tonight, God. Touch lives. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Good psalm. Go back and look at that. It's Psalm 46. Go back and look at that. Because that is something that we as a people, I think I talked about this last time, we worry too much. There, there, are, there are four things that, that keep us from growing in health and being strong. One of them is fear. The other one is anxiety. And they go together. They kind of, fear kind of leads to anxiety, which is a, a heightened state of fear. And so we need to you know, let go of things and learn to trust in God. Really learn to trust in God. You can't do it yourself. If you try, it will fail. And we don't like not being in control. God's in control, and you need to let him be in control of your life and the things that are happening around you. If you will let go and let him do it, he will accomplish it as you call out to him. Amen? Okay. A couple of things I just want to mention to you. Um, there is, ladies, if you're interested, a women's retreat at New Hope Fellowship this weekend, Friday night and Saturday. Linda Holland from ICLV will be here with her team. Uh, they will handle worship and, um, and ministry time and, and, the, and the conference. Um, they're going to be bringing over some ladies. So if you'd like to be a part of that, it starts uh, Friday night. Uh, registration starts at 6 I believe they, they kick it off at 7 o'clock, and then it runs um, Saturday. You can uh, call the office if you'd like more information, 775-751-1867, and um, uh, talk to Kathy because she's the one that's going to answer, and just say, hey, I'd like some information, what, you know, what's going on. I believe it's called Courageous Women is the title of, um, is the title of this retreat, so this conference. So if you'd like to get away Friday night and or Saturday, and can come over, you're invited to come. Come right on over. Um, and so keep that in mind, ladies. Keep that in mind. Uh, you know, this is coming toward the end of the year. And that's something as far as school is concerned. New Hope has, I think it's 10 more days left. We finish the 3rd of June. I believe the public school system finishes a week later. And then we go into summertime. And I know that houses are rattling as kids get antsy because of this time coming, uh, which is a good thing. But parents and, and kids, keep in mind that 
we really never get a break from God, and we don't need one like we do school. So hopefully you are involved in, in, in a church activity, in a youth activity. If not, get involved. Get involved. Be a part of what's happening, of what God is doing. Because it will enrich your lives more and you will grow more even academically if you will put your trust in God and walk with Him. Get into, get into your Bible. Read it every day. Meditate on it, just like we just did here. Just read it and say, wow, what's written in here? And meditate and say, Lord, show me things in this. And He will do that. He will do that. So here we have a summertime coming and a good time for you to just daily get up in the morning, read, read a passage. You could read a passage or a psalm a day. That would take 150 days, which I think will almost be the whole summer. And just sit down and say, God, show me something. And look and see how David handled situations. It's really neat. It's really neat as you, if you can learn to do that. So, ladies, you have a retreat, or there is a retreat at New Hope Fellowship starting Friday, this Friday, at 6 o'clock is registration. It starts off at 7 o'clock. So give a, call, give a call to the office, 775-751-1867, and you can ask for some information there. And with that, go ahead and get that second cup of coffee, find your Bible, turn to Romans 1, and we'll be right back. Romans 10, 9, it says, if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I'll be saved. Romans 10, 9, it says, if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I'll be saved. Welcome back for the second part of One Man's Faith. My name is Neil Owen again. Glad you're here. And we're going to look at Romans 1. And I need you to get a piece of paper. And Mark, I'm going to give you a little quiz. That's why. Mark 1 through 13 on that. Okay? But let's read Romans 1 first. And then I'll give you the quiz. That's just to prepare you. Don't get antsy. It's an easy quiz. Basically true or false. Okay? But let's look at Romans 1 before we do that. Okay? Romans 1. Paul says, Paul a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, whom was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles, for his name's sake, among whom you are also called of Jesus Christ. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God and Father and Lord and, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, that's just the intro to the book of Romans. And we're going to start to look at Romans, and we're going to start to dig for nuggets. But before we do, I want to give you a, um, a little quiz. And so hopefully you, you wrote down 1 through 13. And now the first nine are going to be true-false, okay? The first one is this. A good description of a Christian is a sinner saved by grace. A good description of a Christian is a sinner saved by grace. Now, don't analyze these. Just say, oh, okay, true, or okay, false. Okay? You know, you know don't, they're not trick questions, okay? So a good description of a Christian is a sinner saved by grace. Number two, you can sin and not know it. True or false? You can sin and not know it. Number three, it is normal for Christians to sin every day. It is normal for Christians to sin every day. True or false? 
Number four, a bad thought is a sin. A bad thought is a sin. Okay, number five, it is easier for a Christian to sin than to do right. It is easier for a Christian to sin than to do right. Number six, the closer we get to Christ, the less we will be tempted. The closer we get to Christ, the less we will be tempted. True or false? Number seven, we get closer to Christ through actions of righteousness. We get closer to Christ through actions of righteousness. Number seven, eight, excuse me. Number eight, sainthood is obtained only by a few Christians. Sainthood is attained by only a few Christians. True or false? Number nine, the last true or false one. To be tempted is a sign of our sinfulness. To be tempted is a sign of our sinfulness. All right? Now, number 10, just write, you can just write a number down for this one. Since we're not able to see each other, you don't have to worry about me. I'm not even going to ask you to show me these. So, you know, you know, just think about this. How many sins have you committed today? How many sins have you committed today? Just write a number down. Don't have to be exact. Don't sit there and count on your fingers. How many sins do you think you committed? Number 11, how many acts of righteousness have you committed today? How many acts of righteousness? Number 12, on a scale of 1 to 100, how righteous is Jesus? On a scale of 1 to 100, how righteous is Jesus? And number 13, just like that, on a scale of 1 to 100, how righteous are you? On a scale of 1 to 100, how righteous are you? Okay? Now, let's look at our answers. I think we're going to find something fairly interesting here. If you look at the first nine, and I'll go, ahead, I'll go over them real quickly. A good description of a Christian is a sinner saved by grace. You can sin and not know it. Number three, it is normal for Christians to sin every day. Number four, a bad thought is a sin. Number five, it is easier for a Christian to sin than to do right. Number six, the closer we get to Christ, the less we will be tempted. Number seven, we get closer to Christ through actions of righteousness. Number eight, sainthood is attained by only a few Christians. Number nine, to be tempted is a sign of our sinfulness. All right, those nine. Out of those nine, all nine are false. Out of those nine, all nine are false. And that's what we're going to be doing over the next couple of weeks is looking at some of these questions. Now, I know you're pulling your hair and some of you are wondering, don't you go for that power button or change the channel. Just, just wait. Because I think you'll see some things. Because these are not statements from the Bible. All right? These are st You're not the only one, I guarantee it. The start of a lot of this can go almost all the way back to 300 A.D. It's been going on for a long time. I know a lot of theologies have been built on some of these on some of these statements. But I think we're going to see as we go into Romans that they're false. OK, now I'm not going to teach on them tonight. I'm just getting us started because I want us to see that Romans says the opposite of these. And I want you to see that. I want you to see that. Don't go saying, but Neil, how about this? This is just wait, just wait. 
We'll get there. We'll get there. Okay? But I just want you to understand because we need, as Christians, to change our thinking. We need to understand that we're not under the bus. We're not the tail. We are, we are the head. And a lot of these things have, have put us in a negative or have given us like a negativity to walk in. The first one, for instance, I'm a sinner saved by grace. No, you were a sinner. Oh, now you're being picky. No, I'm not being picky. You were a sinner. When you accepted Jesus, you changed over. The old passed away. Behold, all has become new. Remember that scripture? You're not a sinner anymore. You were a sinner and you were saved by grace. You now are a child of God. You are not a sinner. What happens when you tell somebody over and over again, you're stupid? They believe it. And it becomes part of their psyche. In the same way, when we say, when we just say, oh, I'm a sinner, saved by grace. No, you were. God saved you. You are now a child of God. So that's not a true statement. You are not still a sinner. But now I sin. Ah, that'll be something we'll look at. Because I'm going to tell you right now, Paul says that if you've died to sin, how can you still live in it? So we're going to, we're going to be looking. We're going to be looking at that. Now, let me go on. Let me just, let me just hit these last um, uh these last couple of questions. Um, how many sins have you committed today? The answer should be zero, truthfully. And we're going to look at this. How many acts of righteousness? It shouldn't be just a couple. Everything you do should be an act of righteousness. So it should be an answer of many. You know, I don't mean the word many, but you should have quite a few acts of righteousness that you have committed today. Okay. How righteous is Jesus? Oh, well, that was a gimme. We know he was 100% righteous. But how righteous are you? The same. You should be. And you are. Righteousness means right standing before God. If you've got Jesus in your heart and you're walking his way, then you are 100% righteous. You have that capability to stand in front of God and not be killed. So the answer should be 100% even for you. So we're going to start to look at these things. Paul, Paul goes through this. Paul is great about this. Uh, you know, I always say you almost have to be a, a lawyer to understand this book. Lawyers, if any of you are lawyers, you'll really understand this book because he... He takes us through and shows us step by step. As a matter of fact, you can almost get lost in Romans because he makes a statement and then he backs it up. Or he, he, he gives you a thesis and then gives you the statement. And so you, you've got to kind of follow it. And you've got to be able to, to as you're reading a passage, say, okay, you know, what was said before that? Okay, you know, where is he going? And you kind of, you kind of got to... Keep in mind what he said at the beginning and what he said um, where you're reading and see because it, 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 in, a, it in a sense flows toward um, the objectives he's bringing forth. And so I'm going to do something a little different in that I want to look at nuggets, nuggets of gold in Romans. I... I think it would take us way too long to go through it precept upon precept. I don't think we need to. I think we can look at nuggets of gold that Paul has in there, and we can back up those nuggets with, with what he has said, okay? So we're going to look at it, I guess, more from a, um, uh, a theme standpoint rather than precept upon precept. We'll probably cover it all, but... 
I want to give you something, and then we're going to look at it. The first thing we're going to talk about is Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and to the Greek. All right, Romans 1.16. Keep your Bible open. Get that third cup of coffee and get ready. We're going to take a break, and we'll be right back. Romans 10, 9, says, If I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I'll be saved. Romans 10, 9, says, If I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I'll be saved. Welcome back for the third part of One Man's Faith. We're starting to look at Romans. We're going to look at nuggets, and I just gave you a little quiz. Hopefully you didn't get too upset, and thank you for being back. Um, we're going to start to look at those things, but I want to look at a nugget first here in Romans 1.16 as we start, and that is Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Okay, this is an interesting statement that Paul makes. It's part of his kind of introduction uh, to what he's saying. He's, he, he says he's glad uh, because of the faith that he's heard. He wants to go and share with them. He wants to impart to them uh, a spiritual a spiritual gift, uh, and he wants to receive fruit back from them. And in, that, in all of that, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Now, when we say gospel, what does it mean? Okay, what is Paul saying here? Well, it's exactly what you think. The word gospel means good news. All right? So we can say, I am not ashamed of the good news, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Okay? Now, the next question, what is good news? How much is good news? Now, I know that you're probably sitting there and you could spout off some of the good news, but what is the good news? Okay? Let me go here and then and then and let's proceed. The symbol for Christianity and for most of the Christian realm is the cross. Okay? Why? Why is the cross the symbol for Christianity? And now hear me, because why it in the tomb? The cross really is a symbol of death. It was. Remember one time Jesus says, if you don't deny me, and take up your cross and follow me. In the vernacular of today, we could say, he who, doesn't, he who denies me and doesn't take up his electric chair and follow me. You see, that was a symbol of death. The cross is a symbol of death. Jesus died on that cross. Yes. His blood was spilt, which became the covenant. Because you see, he spilt his blood. That blood became the covering for sin for us. It was the start of a new covenant. A different covenant from the old covenant. Jesus the man formed a new covenant for mankind and died to seal the deal. Okay? When Adam and Eve blew it, everything that was in the garden is what was supposed to be. That's the way it was supposed to be. Okay? They blew it, and so God set up a plan of redemption to bring man back to him. Now, we have 2,000 years where 
God just dealt individually with individuals. Okay? He obviously showed them what to do because Cain and Abel had that struggle about sacrifice to God, okay? But after 2,000 years, he, he, started, he started something new by setting up a covenant with a whole nation, okay? What we call the Old Covenant. And it's really based on Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, what the Jewish people call the Torah. That was the law that was given by God to the Jewish people. All right? That didn't work. Animal sacrifices cannot totally atone for our sins. What was required was a covenant by a man with God that started something new. And this is what Jesus came and did. He did not come as the Son of God. He came as the Son of Man. He did not walk through this earth based on his Godship. That would have negated the whole thing. He had to walk as you and me and die as a sacrifice for you and me. Because Hebrews, I believe it's Hebrews 9, tells us that um, and for this reason he is a mediator. This is uh, Hebrews 9, 15 and 16. For this reason he is the mediator of a new covenant in order that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the internal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. God's law is that there has to be a death for the covenant to be valid. Now, the old covenant was done by the death of animals. Okay? The new covenant was set in motion by the death of the ultimate sacrifice, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But he had to come. Look, if he was just going to come as the Son of God, then why go through the complete birth process? Why have to grow up from an infant, a newborn, to a man 30 years of age? That wouldn't be necessary if he was going to come on earth and be the Son of God. Yes, he was the son of God, but not in his royalty and uh, all the power that goes with that. He really wasn't God when he was here. He was man. And that's what makes this covenant so significant that he walked through life without sinning. It's not that we can look at his life and say, God, Jesus did that because he was God. No! That's a lie. He walked through just like you and me so that we could look and see Jesus did it. I've got something I can go for. See, if we look at him as just being God, then we can sit here and say, well, I guess I have to sin, which is not true either. Jesus walked through this life as man. Now, let me stop right here and just say, he did it with the Holy Spirit, which we'll get to in just a minute. But he walked through and did not sin. And he set up a new covenant with God the Father as a man. And he died to seal it. 
That's what the cross represents. But that's only part of the good news. That's the start of the good news. Part two is the resurrection, the tomb. Jesus died. He was a man. He died. He was put in a tomb. Normally, his body would have rotted there. It would have decayed just like you and I will when we die. It was, in, and it was inevitable because he was man, but God called him forth in resurrection power and in a sense said something to what he said to Lazarus. God said, Son or Jesus, come forward. And Jesus arose in resurrection power. He, be, he was the beginning of new life. He was what is called the firstborn of many brethren. It was a new starting point, a new beginning. There was a power to overcome death that came because Jesus died and was resurrected by the Father. That wasn't to be a one-time occurrence. That was the start of what you and I walk through and walk in. That's the second part of the good news. You see, it's not just the cross. And people understand the cross is empty. The cross is a symbol of death. Part two is the tomb. Now, maybe we use a cross because it's hard to carry around a tomb on a, on a pole. You know, you know, I don't know. But the tomb, with the, the cross without the tomb is only part of, the, part of the story. The tomb without the cross is only part of the story. They go together. They go together. And we need to be able to give the full truth. Romans 10 says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, that's the cross, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that's the tomb, you shall be saved. Both of them go together. And so we have to be able to look and see, okay, Here's the whole story. As a, who was it, Paul, what was the guy's name? Uh, he used to say, and that's the rest of the story. I can't, I can't remember what Paul's last name was. But we need to give the whole story when we give the story, not part of it. And we need to walk in that and understand that there is a second part. But... Hey, we're talking God. God works in threes. We have the cross. We have the tomb. The third part of the good news is walking in the power of the Spirit. That's how Jesus was able to do it. That was the secret. He was able to walk in in the power of the Spirit, and the Spirit brought all knowledge to him. It brought a power to him that allowed him to overcome the sin or the temptations that came before him. So there's a three-part story here. The cross, the tomb, and walking in the Spirit. And that's where we are. That's where we are. And when you put together walking in the Spirit with the power of the cross and the power of the resurrection, or the power of the blood, the power of the resurrection, and the power of the Spirit, then you get the ability to overcome. 
There's nothing that can come against you that you can't overcome. That's the way God built it. Jesus said, I've come to bring you life more abundantly now. He didn't come and say, I've come that you will have life in the future. As a matter of fact, um, Paul tells uh, Timothy and uh, and First Timothy, um, ooh, is it five? Um, he he tells him. Um, For bodily discipline is only for a little bit. But godliness is profitable for all things since it holds the promise for the present life and the life to come. So, see, God, Jesus didn't come to bring us life for the future. He came to bring us life for now. Godliness is beneficial for now and in the future. That's what Jesus did. That is the good news. We have the ability to overcome if we'll use it. But we have to use it. And we have to learn to walk in it. And so... It's set up to be a three-part deal. Walking in the Spirit with the power of the resurrection under the blood of Jesus. That's what the good news is. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the good news, for it is the power of God to salvation for all those who believe. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. Romans 10, 9, says, If I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I'll be saved. Romans 10, 9, says, If I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I'll be saved. Welcome back for the last part of One Man's Faith. I hope you are kind of understanding what is being said. Um, the gospel is not just Jesus died. The good news, the gospel, is Jesus died, God resurrected him, and through that, the power of the Holy Spirit came that we are to walk in. So the good news is all this. We start by coming in the covenant with God through Jesus, by accepting Jesus as our Lord and believing that God raised him from the dead. This is what Paul says in uh, Romans, Romans chapter 10. He says, uh, should have already been there, huh? He says in Romans chapter 10, That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. This is Romans 10, 9 and 10. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness. See, there it is. By believing, you result in righteousness, therefore you're righteous. And with the mouth he confesses resulting in salvation. You see, salvation is two parts. You believe it and you confess it. That's why it's important to confess it. You know, I don't totally understand why people say, okay, bow your, bow your heads. Nobody look around. If you want to accept Jesus, go ahead, raise your hand. It's, it's, it's like we're embarrassed for people 
to come to know Jesus. And we kind of put on an air of, don't worry about it, no one's going to know. No. Paul tells us here, you not only have to believe it, you have to confess it. It has to come out of your mouth. Yes, I believe Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead. That's got to come out of our mouths. You know, and, and I'm not trying to put you down. I mean, if you accept Jesus that way, great. But now confess it if you haven't. Confess it. To, go to somebody. Tell people, I'm saved. Jesus saved me. Confess it. That's part of it. As a matter of fact, he says, he says believing results in righteousness confession results in salvation. You could almost say that if you don't confess it, you're not saved. Because confession results in salvation. So confess it. That's step one. You do not go home to the Father unless you have accepted Jesus. There's no other way. I'm sorry. There is no other way. That's what the Word of God says. You can only, you'll only live eternally if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. That's the only way. I'm not trying to be harsh. That's just the truth. We have to come to that understanding. And at that time, you change. You put off the old self. You become new. You leave the world and you are transferred to the kingdom of righteousness, out of the kingdom of darkness. That all happens when you make that confession. God comes in and he breathes life into your spirit and makes you alive again. You were dead before you made that confession. That is required. That is a requirement that you confess and believe that Jesus is Lord. And the Bible tells us that is the only way. That's step one. Step two, in order to understand the good news, the next step is you ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't care whether you call it baptism of the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, what you want to call it. But biblically, I think we can see that we need to ask for that. Say, Father God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Because that's what brings the power. Jesus even told his disciples, if you remember, he said, you go to Jerusalem and don't you leave until you've been filled with the, spot, filled with the Spirit. Because that is the power of God. That is the power. This, uh, in, Acts, in Acts chapter 1, as, as, as he was leaving, he says, he says, um, and you shall be filled, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. You see, to be his witnesses, there has to be the power. That, that resurrection power comes into you and brings a power for you to overcome. That's the Spirit's job within you. Now, but Neil, didn't he breathe into them in John? Yes, he breathed new life into them. The wording there really is receive holy breath. They were dead. Jesus breathed holy breath, life into them. That's the salvation experience. And then he says, you wait in Jerusalem until you receive the power 
and then you go be my witnesses. You see, we can walk around without that and struggle the rest of our lives. Or we can take that step and say, Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me to overflowing, God. Lord, I want to be a witness for you. And if you'll do that, then you will walk in resurrection power. So accept Jesus, ask him to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and thirdly, learn to walk in it. We were not meant to be creatures that came, got filled, and then sat on our butt and did nothing. That's not what this Christian, Christian life is all about. In Ephesians 4, verse 1, he says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you were called. Do it with all humility, gentleness, patience, showing forbearance to one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Okay? So, step three, step one, accept Jesus as Lord. Step two, receive the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, whatever you want to call that. Step three, walk in it. God has something for you to do. God wants Pahrump changed. Jesus' purpose in coming was to bring the kingdom. He said the kingdom of God is at hand. It's here. It's at hand. It's in your hand. Do something with it. The kingdom is not just coming when Jesus comes back. When he comes back, he's going to reign in the kingdom that is being set up by us, his people. So we are to proclaim the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of God is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you've received all those things, now give them away. And that's what our job is. Matthew, 20, Matthew 28, 19, 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And what did he command you? Go, preach, saying, the kingdom is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out demons. You see, there's something for us to do. We can make a difference in Pahrump. But we've got, we've got to give up our fear and we've got to learn to walk in the power of the spirit that God has placed within us. I want to encourage you guys. Go. Let's change Pahrump. Show, let's show Pahrump that there's a reason to be a Christian. Let's change the world. Let's change Pahrump. Let's get our churches filled with people that want to know more and are willing to walk in the power of the Spirit with you. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you next time. Romans 10, 9, it says, if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I'll be saved.